Hi, this is Lori Phillips, and I am going to show you how I made this vase out of pinch pots on my kitchen table. These are the tools I use to put this vase together, but what you use is going to vary depending on your own style and how you like to decorate your work, so most of them are kind of optional. And there's alternatives to most of them. These three tools I'd say you do need, or some variation of them. A rib, a knife, and a scoring tool. Okay, maybe a needle tool too. If you're able to get a hold of some hardy backer board from your hardware store, I highly recommend it as a much less dusty alternative to working or wedging on canvas. And it won't risk getting plaster in your clay like mixing up and scraping off a plaster slab might. But if all you have is some fabric uh, to work on or just your tabletop, that's fine too. This vase has three sections, so I have two balls of clay for each one. Bottom, middle, and top. This workshop does assume you're already familiar with making a basic pinch pot, but if you're not, that's okay. It's about the simplest form you can make in clay and is generally one of the first things taught to you when you start ceramics. YouTube likely has tons of tutorials to help get you started if you need to practice your pinch pot skills first. You can make all your pinch pots entirely with your hands, but if you have some kind of throwing stick it will speed things up a bit. That there's my beaten stick, and I made it myself while I was in grad school. It's my favorite tool ever. A second ago, you see me wipe the rim of my pot with water. I do this a lot to keep the rim of the pot from cracking, because it's constantly being moved and stretched as I rotate the pot in my hand and tap the inside wall against my palm. I constantly check the thickness of the pot with my fingers and pinch out the thicker spots so everything stays even. As the pot gets bigger, I stretch and smooth it out against the palm of my hand. This also helps me make the walls more even and make it larger more easily than just pinching it out alone. I've done this to both pieces for the bottom segment of the vase and I want to make sure the rims are the same size so that after they've stiffened up just a little bit, I can put them together and make a hollow sphere. While those are setting up, I've started doing the same thing with the two smaller balls of clay for the middle segment. If you don't have any foam to rest your work on, you can fold up an old towel instead and maybe lay some plastic on top or a sheet or old pillowcase if you don't want any fuzzy towel texture transferring to your pots. The top segment's a little different. I made one ball of pinch pot, but the neck of the vase needs to be hollow, so the very top piece will start out more like a donut than a ball with a hole pushed in it. As I pinch out the clay, I want the top to narrow, so I'll alternate between pinching and compressing the neck back. That way it starts to work up instead of just out. Squishing it in and pinching it up and squishing it in and pinching it up. Uh, the bottom of the neck needs to be the same size as the rim of the piece it will be attached to, so I'm keeping that in mind as I pinch and flip and pinch and flip uh, the neck out over and over. Is that confusing? That might sound confusing. It'll make sense in just a moment. Don't let your rims dry out, they will crack. Yeah, see, those two pieces. They need to fit together, and I need to thin that neck out a little bit more. And I was wrong about only needing two balls of clay for the top segment of this vase uh, because I want a much longer neck than what I have here. So I need to pinch out one more donut of clay into a smaller cylinder and attach it to what will be the very top of the piece. Squeezing those walls back in as I turn it and pinch the clay up will give me a longer neck that I want for the top of the piece. And if I trim those ends and keep them even, then when I go to attach these later, they'll sit evenly on one another and not be all wobbly wompus. 
The knife will also help me to better adjust things how I want beyond just pinching alone. The next is a bit wider than I want at the top, so cutting a triangular strip out of the side, a strip that's wider at the top and thinner at the bottom, will get me closer to the shape that I want when I reconnect the cylinder. I hope that makes sense. I feel like I have a hard time explaining things because I'm very visual, but maybe watching and listening to me at the same time, it'll kind of all come together for you. Um, then I just spend a bit of time smoothing out the seam. This is right out of the bag wet clay, so I don't need to score it. There we go. Uh, that could make a nice bottle all on its own, but I have other plans. And the edges of these cylinders will dry out fast, so keep them covered. And here are all my parts, all ready to be Frankenstein together. For scoring your pieces before you put them together, you can use a lot of things from your needle tool to even a fork if you need to. This guy I picked up at my local ceramic store and it is my favorite. All the little prongs are adjustable uh, and when you dunk it in water it holds a little bit like some kind of metal paintbrush. This is important because I don't add slip when I join pieces together. I make slip on the piece as I score it by dunking my little scoring tool in the water and wetting it as I go. When I do this thoroughly to both sides there's plenty of slip to hold my joint. Now I can carefully join my two halves together to make the bottom segment of my vase. As I turn it and press the edges together, I give it a little shimmy all the way around so it's really stuck well. Uh, once it's connected all the way around, it will be airtight and the resistance of the air inside will help it hold its shape, even if you like to work with fairly soft, wet clay like I do. All of my parts have had time to set up a little bit, but they're not quite leather hard yet. I usually work with fairly soft clay. I think I'm just really impatient. Now I have to do the same thing to the middle segment. These edges weren't quite as equal in size as the ones I just did, so you can watch me fuss with getting things lined up nicely, which will happen sometimes, so try not to be too frustrated. Looking good. Looking good. Looking up. Up. Boop. Blah. Blah. If you get a little underbite in the seam, you can squeeze and sort of pucker back out the spot that's trying to buckle under. Uh, this is why you don't want to shove and shimmy things together too harshly until you know you have it all lined up first because you might just have to tear it back apart again and again and again. Nom 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 nom. And the same deal with the top. I won't have air resistance helping me keep things in shape this time, so I have to be a bit more gentle not to push a big dent in my form or overly misshapen the whole thing, which I have done so many times. This is also a good time to remind you that in ceramics, especially when hand building, things can look really ugly and clunky before you get to the refinement stage. Don't let it discourage you. Clay demands patience, and there are a few tools that can help make a huge difference. We'll get to those in just a bit. If you have a round bottom on something and you need it to stand up for a while while you work on it, you can use some plastic bags to cradle the bottom of your piece. 
uh, just like that. Make a little donut. Sit them in there. There you go. That's nice. Stay. I use this little ball tool all the time, and they come in all different sizes. This is a Kemper tool, and I have no idea what it's actually called, but I've seen them at craft stores sold as doll eye socket makers, which is kind of creepy, but they're super handy. I'm going to use it to smooth out the seam on the inside of this neck because I can't reach it with my fingers, but something like a smooth stick would also work. I'm just smoothing out the excess slip as it has set up a little bit, but we're gonna roll a coil out and I'm gonna use that coil to fill the seam and get everything really firmly attached and make it uh, easier to smooth out in just a minute. I'm gonna lay this coil inside the seam um, just loosely at first and then I'm gonna tap and press it into place and really work it in there and smooth it out I'm going to carefully and firmly work my way around all the joints doing this. And we're just about done filling in all our seams, but things are still a little heavy, a little ugly, so we're gonna make them look nicer. Rims dry out fast, keep them covered. This is a sure form. It's made by Mudworks, but sometimes you can get other versions of it at the hardware store. It's like a cheese grater for your clay. It's great at taking the bulkiness off of hand-built work and refining the shape. It'll make a lot of texture on your clay, but you can smooth that out with a rib tool. This red rib is also a Mudworks tool, and it's my favorite rib for how soft and flexible it is, but any rib will do. You can even cut up an old credit card or a gift card to make your own custom shaped ribs if you need to. And if you have one of these hand rollers, they are great at rolling out all the lumps and bumps. You can pick up or order them from most ceramic supply stores. And hey, if you like the lumps and bumps on your clay, that's cool. I do too. You can totally just leave them as part of your surface or even push them further if you want to. But this particular piece needs shaping and refinement. I usually don't use a sure form and I just go in with the roller, but if all you have is a rib, you can use that to smooth out your surface too. It'll take a little bit longer, but it's not a big deal. I usually pinch out my work fairly thin, but I want to take a little bit of bulk off of these. Um, so I'm going to use the sure form, just like one thin layer scraped off the outside of all of the pieces. If your clay is too wet, this will just gum up, but if your clay is too dry, it really makes a mess. So kind of find your own medium. This can really take a lot of clay off your work really fast, so you want to periodically kind of feel for thin spots to make sure you're not going to go through it. And when you get things kind of how you want them, then you can go in with the rib tool and smooth them out. Or you can leave the texture. I'm not going to tell you what to do. You do what you want. The sure form really came in handy for the neck of this piece and I really feel like it helped me get my form a little closer to what was in my head. But you'll see in a second where because I didn't let my pieces sit wrapped up either for a few hours or overnight, 
The sure form exposes the seam where I put my parts together. This is because the area I scored is still a little wetter than the parts around it. If you wrap your piece up after attaching the parts and leave it alone for a while or overnight, the wetness of the clay will have time to homogenize or even out. You can see it right there. I can smooth that back out with my rib tool, but once I get everything constructed in this piece, I'm gonna wrap it up really well with plastic and just let it sit for maybe two or three days at least and let everything even out. Because if you let things dry unevenly, they'll crack. And I really don't wanna fire this in the kiln after all of this work just to pull it out with a big crack on it. So I'm gonna try to have more patience next time. <laughs> All right, this is the next day, so I'm unwrapping my parts because I'm going to attach them all. I also want to shape some things a little bit differently on this bottom piece, so I poked a hole in it so that I don't have that air resistance anymore. And I can kind of tap things in and let them mush in a little bit. Um, they're a little stiffer now, so it's not as delicate. And I want this middle piece to sit on top. Um, I like that bevel in, so I want to smush it in a little bit with the top piece to kind of get the shape on the bottom piece that I want if that makes sense. I hope that makes sense. You don't even have to leave these pieces around if you don't want to. You can use a flat surface like the table or a paddle to make them into cubes or some other shape. That curve right there, where they meet. That's kinda, kinda what I'm going for. Almost like they're nested together. And like I mentioned earlier, the hand roller is really good for kinda pushing things into the shape that I want. And I want my top piece to nest into the middle piece just like the bottom. And when I get them all put together, should look something like, like that. That's the idea anyway, let's find out. Now remember, I'm putting this together to form a larger vase, so I need to attach the pieces, but they also need to form one hollow vessel instead of separate compartments. So I need to place one part at a time and mark where they meet. Then I'll know where to cut my holes so that there's still enough clay to score together to form a reliable connection. I don't want these to sit crooked, so I'm just kind of turning it and looking at it from all angles so that I can see that it's straight. And this is a stylus tool. You can mark your clay with whatever you want, but because this has a tiny ball on the end, it can get into the tight seam of my piece and the ball will mark the top and the bottom pieces at the same time. Now 
That line doesn't dictate where I cut my holes. It's where the two pieces begin to meet. I want their connection to be about a half inch wide, so that's how far in I'm gonna make a second line in the clay, and that's where I'll make my cut for both pieces. Now I can smooth out the first line because I don't want it to show. You might want to stick something into the middle of that clay before you cut a big hole out because otherwise it's like when you opening a can with a can opener and you go too far and then the lid falls into the can and you gotta fish it out. <laughs> if you have something stuck in there first then you can kind of just lift the whole thing out when you get all the way around. Now I can see the seam that I made earlier and I can kind of get my hand in there and smooth it out. It's a little hard to reach so I'm gonna use my wooden ball tool to help me get in there and smooth it out. And because the bit of slip that's oozed out on that inside seam uh, has had time to stiffen up, it sort of acts as a coil you can kind of pack down and help reinforce the joint you made. Same deal with the middle piece, but this time I could reach it with my finger. I'm gonna do that whole same process over again for the top piece and the middle piece, but I haven't made any connections yet. I'm gonna do that last. I do kinda of wanna belly that form out a little bit more, so I'm putting my stick in there and kinda of working it, working its way out um, because it's still soft enough for me to alter the form a little bit. And I'm gonna keep the rim wrapped up because rims will dry out really quickly. I can also now go in and make some changes to the other forms now that I can either get in there with a tool or my hands to push things out. I'm gonna lift this rim up because when I get these pieces scored and ready to attach, this will give me extra resistance to push them together and make a good connection without smushing my pieces. I really want to make as much slip as I can on both the top and the bottom of these pieces because I know I'm not going to be able to get in there with my hand and pinch them together. But hopefully you'll see what I mean right here by making resistance by lifting that rim up so that I can smoosh them into one another. Just want to give it a really good firm wiggle. I'm gonna attach the top, but I want to keep the outside of this from getting too dry, so I'm gonna wrap it up before I do that. Like a cozy little blanket. I've attached the top the same way I did the middle to the bottom, and I'm leaving that ring of slip there to stiffen up a bit. I'm actually gonna just wrap the whole piece up in plastic and let the moisture of those joints even out with the rest of the clay overnight. I don't feel comfortable laying it on its side yet with those fresh connections. I want its own weight to hold them together firmly. So because it's still round on the bottom, I'm going to use all my extra foam and plastic to cradle around it so it stays upright on its own. As long as you know, nobody bumps into the table or anything at least. <laughs> uh, now it is a brand new day, time to get to work. I'm going to use my ball tool to smooth out the inside of this neck. I also kind of decided that I wanted to use this ball tool to sort of put a little bit more of a belly on the neck of this piece. So I'm just going to 
push it out and reshape it a little bit. Belly on the belly on the neck. That sounds weird. <laughs> And I'm gonna use my knife to refine the edge of the vase. I like a lot of my rims to have a little bit of a dip in them and a rise and fall line to them. So I'm just gonna carve it out and then I can go in uh, with my fingers and a little water and smooth everything out. Take some time to make things look, look nice, look refined. Okay, I like to make my work look like there's maybe layers growing out of other layers, usually from the bottom up, so I generally work from the top down, and I use something to mark where my layers will start so that I have a bit of a guideline, kind of sketching on the piece. I will show you the process of some of the ways I decorate my surfaces, but what this video and other tutorials are really about is not how to make that piece. They're there to help you form a solid arsenal of techniques to choose from when you're experimenting and figuring out the best solution to making your own work. My work is mostly additive and sculptural and really botanical, but maybe you'd rather carve your work or maybe you're more inspired by more historical forms in art or something less organic and more geometric. Or maybe you'd rather have a smooth, clean surface that you can use glazes to draw on. All of that's great. The overall process of this tutorial can work for all of those things. And the more you try, the wider your vocabulary, so to speak, will become. I am currently using my wooden ball tool to roll a wooden texture into the top of my vase. I started with the larger tool, but then I went to the smaller ball tool so that I can kind of go in and refine the texture a little bit so that it, nothing looks arbitrary. And then I'm gonna mark where my next layer is gonna start. And this is why I kind of keep things um, sort of as wet as possible as I work, because I'm not gonna score every little bit um, that I add clay to, but if I keep the surface really wet, then I don't really need to. I never have a problem with anything popping off because the clay I use is right out of the bag um, and it sticks really easily. So I'm just gonna make these little feathery, floofy, bloopy bits over and over all the way around the piece. And I spray the surface of my work down with my water bottle quite a lot. I'm just remarking my line because I tend to lose it as I smooth down the layer above it. And I just do this again and again and again and again and again. You know, I really don't have as much patience as my work makes it look like I do. And then I'm just gonna build the next layer by adding a coil and smoothing it down and then I'll just kind of repeat these steps all the way down with whatever kind of texture I decide to use next. Most of the time I do sketch my pieces out before I make them. Every once in a while I'll kind of wing it, but for the most part I have it planned out. It, it doesn't always go as planned, but I try to plan it out.
And like I said, I use this tool a lot. And again, do not let your rims dry out before the rest of your piece has dried out. Keep them covered. Oh, and little hair clips are awesome for holding your plastic in place. An old damp paintbrush is one of my favorite tools to smooth out any surface or refine crummy edges or smooth down little bits of slip that you've joined your piece with. Sometimes a wooden tool can be a little bit too aggressive when you're just trying to gently smooth something out so a wet uh, paintbrush can give you just enough resistance but won't mar your surface. But I do want to get in there a little bit better and kind of squish in and compact some of that slip so I have a wooden tool that I just sanded both ends of. One's really sharp and then one's a little bit rounded. Um, so I can kind of get right in there and just, I don't know, compress might not be the right word but just really shape that seam so it's not so uneven. And now I'm just gonna move my way on down the piece and mark out where I want my next layer to end and keep on going. I spend a lot of time thinking about exactly how I want that layer to lay. So it's nice being able to just kind of easily erase and go back in and erase and adjust lines in the clay. Most of the tools that I use are just little wooden sticks like this that I've either sanded into the shape I want or they came that way, but I've kind of altered them. Um, even if you don't have sandpaper, I've taken a stick out to like the sidewalk or just the concrete floor of a studio and sanded it down into the shape that I wanted. So most of my tools are just full of like all different little sticks that I've sanded into different ways and shapes and stuff. <laughs> Nothing beats a tool that you've sort of adjusted and customized to your own needs. Oh, hello friend. I believe he is a fungus gnat. They like to lick the water off your clay. I looked it up because I kind of like bugs. This seam was actually too narrow for me to get my brush or my wooden tool into, so I actually had to use my needle tool. Um, so it worked out. But considering how that seam will probably eventually be filled with glaze, this is probably overkill, but that's a story of my life. Before I go on to the bottom segment of this piece, I'm going to stop and make feet for it um, so that they have time to set up while I do the bottom half. They are technically just more pinch pots, they're just really little ones. I'm going to leave those feet out to get leather hard while I work on the bottom of the piece. This texture was originally inspired by how lichen grows across the surface, but 
also what's called a bird's nest fungus, which I highly recommend looking up. It looks like if fairies made tiny bowls of lentil soup. Now I'm ready to lay this down and attach the feet. The top of it's more narrow, so it needs a little more support towards that end. Um, so I'm just gonna build up some foam. I'm just kind of guessing at first where I think these feet should go. Um, I'll just kind of use a little water to stick them on there and when I pick the piece up I can kind of gauge if I need to move one this way or that way. Um, it just takes a little trial and error. Uh, sometimes, sometimes a lot of error. And then without letting go of the bottom, I can kind of just slightly sit it, um, not all of its weight, but sit most of its weight down. And then I'll look at it and then I'll turn it a little bit and I'll look at it because sometimes it'll lean way one side to the other and then I'll know that I need to move that foot in a little bit and keep adjusting it until it sits straight up. That looks about right, so I'm gonna attach the feet. I'm just gonna mark uh, exactly where that foot goes so that I can pull it off and score where I need to score and stick it back on. Hey, remember that hole that I had poked in the bottom of this piece? This is a vase now, so nobody wants a hole in the bottom of their vase, so let's uh, not forget to plug that up. Uh, now I can just double check to make sure that it's still sitting straight up and down like it's supposed to before I finish the rest of the piece. Sometimes you just need a, a little extra neck support, you know what I'm saying? And I am almost done with the construction of this piece. I am going to poke some holes in those hollow feet. It's actually not impossible to fire a hollow form with no hole in it without it exploding, but I'd rather not try to prove that with this piece. That's for another video. This is only the second ceramics tutorial I've ever recorded so far, so I hope it was useful to you. There was so much more I wanted to talk about and explain, but then this video would be like three hours long. So this will have to do for now. But if you have any questions at all about this video or anything ceramics related, you can send me a message either on Instagram or Facebook at Lori Phillips Ceramics or email me at lepceramics at gmail.com. 
just have to stamp this and then it is all done. Or at least the first important part of it's done. It still has to dry and get bisque fired and hopefully not crack and then glaze it and fire it again and hopefully still not crack. I've been doing ceramics for a little over 20 years now and these things still happen. If it happens to you, just know that you are not alone in your frustration. The good news is you can just make another one and it'll probably be better the second time you make it anyway. Or the third time. Or the fourth time. Or the fifth or sixth time. We've all been there. My last step before I call this done is to take my damp brush and go over all the little rough bits and get them cleaned up. Uh, I usually do that when it's uh, green wear, totally dry, but I'm a little pressed for time at the making of this video, so it's all good. It's okay if it's just leather hard, it can still be done. Just a little bit of water on the brush um, will help smooth out surfaces. I can run it over all these little goobery bits that happen when I sort of carve texture into the surface of the piece or if I get a sharp edge um, anywhere it can really smooth it out and make it look uh, way more refined and makes a huge difference with uh, how nice your piece looks at the end of everything and uh, will also help keep your work from cutting people and hurting people you don't want to do that uh, so just it's really worth just taking a little bit of the extra time to go over the whole piece if you have little bits like that and getting rid of them as of the moment that this video first airs, uh, in the beginning of May 2020, this face has not yet even been bisque fired, but if you want to follow along with how it goes and how it looks when it's finished, uh, I will be showing that on my Instagram page, which also gets posted to my Facebook page. So if you follow me over there, then you can find out if my vase needs to be remade a second or third or fourth time. Thanks for watching!